If I were to say to you this afternoon, clustered, regularly interspaced, short, palindromic repeats, CRISPR, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you care? Really, you should be worried about it. CRISPR, as the anachronism says, refers to a process of taking segments of DNA strands and kind of manipulating them, cutting out desired cutouts, adding, desire, added interest, uh, adding new genes to comply with our wishes. It's a DNA manipulation, if you would, a procedure that can change your whole genetic makeup. Now remember, any such change, though, is passed on to the coming generations, for good or for bad. It shows you how far our knowledge in science has advanced. Lots of ethical issues there. Ethics referring not to whether we can do something, but rather whether we should do something or not, huh? Some ethicists would argue with, with this CRISPR stuff, we're beginning to go where we should not be going, kind of like artificial intelligence. Some people are arguing the same there. Now, some like me are exploring the ethical issues, trying to come to some conclusions about its benefits and its harm, both artificial intelligence and CRISPR. It's not just science, though, huh, that causes such concerns. Our faith stance, our acceptance of theological teachings also raises issues. Trinity. If I were to say to you, we worship a God who is one, yet three persons. Trinity. Do you know what I'm talking about? And do you care? Again, you should be worried about it. There are lots of questions about theology, about divine trinity, and how it affects our daily lives down the generations, and how it leads to our salvation. And much ink has been spilt on this topic, huh? God is like a clover with three leaves. And there's a new one, kind of neat, I think. God is like a light that is shot through a th prism, and there are three separate versions of that light come out. It's the same light but it's split into threes. Hmm. God is like this, God is like that. You even hear some theologians argue that we're going to where we should not go. There are some things that we are not meant to know. The inner workings, perhaps, of how the Trinity happens. Today, Trinity Sunday, we celebrate the great mystery of God. God, the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, God the Divine Spirit, the source and grace of love. Not three gods, but one God with three separate divine personages. Makes your heads spin a little bit thinking about it. You may remember the story of St. Augustine. I'm sure some of them remember that from grade school. St. Augustine's walking along the shores of North Africa. He sees a little kid digging a big hole in the sand and he takes his little pail, goes over, gets the ocean water, pours it in, goes back pours it in, goes back, pours it in, and St. Augustine says, what in the heck are you doing? And little kid says, I'm going to pour the ocean in this hole. St. Augustine says, intelligent man that he was, well, that's illogical and that's impossible. And as the story goes, the little boy said, not as much impossible as you understanding what Trinity is about. And then the little boy disappears, an angel of God, supposedly. If I, ever meet, if I ever meet Jesus, and that's a big if, I have a question or two about the workings of natural science and about theological principles like Trinity, troubling theological principles that we don't understand. For instance, how can Jesus be 100% human and 100% divine at the same time? We children of God have an innate need to know things, an insatiable desire we need to know that's part of human nature, always inquisitive, always trying to figure out what works and why. There's a certain joy in discovery on the scientific level and natural level and even the intricacies of human life, the level of human life. But having questions doesn't necessarily mean we will always get the answers we desire. The answer I have received so far, this to date from God about Trinity and other issues, in general has been not of your business. Well, if that's the answer, that's an answer, but not very satisfying, huh? That inquisitiveness about 
what we don't know is part of life, yes, and the answers received is not always satisfying. It seems the conclusion we draw at present about this Trinity stuff, huh, is in our concern is really none of our business. My mother, God rest her, was one to ask me, being a priest, what I knew about this, about that, about so and such, and how could a person think themselves a good Christian, example, a movie actor who had been married five times, how that person could get married in the Catholic Church. Other parishioners in different parishes over the years, Father, can you tell me about so and such? Father, what's going on in that family? Father, have you heard about this person or that person? Or Father, let me tell you about that person. And in each episode, as politely as possible, to my mother and to parishioners, my response usually is, that's none of your business. No, I don't need to know that. And no, you don't need to know about that. Consider your own difficulties in living out the gospel commands, how others are doing in their challenge in charge of gospel life. In the end, truly it is none of our business. Well, on this Trinity Sunday weekend, what is our business? What is it that we need to know about life, about God, about living the good news? Rather than wasting time and energy, attempting to understand the inner workings of God, we should be content with the knowledge of God's love for us. We should know of the saving actions of Jesus Christ. We need to know about the Holy Spirit empowering us, empowering creation, giving human life and guidance to the Lord Jesus and giving to all of us who remain children of God the ability to accept that good news in faith, to live the gospel, to share the gospel, so as to seek the coming kingdom of God. The how of a lot of this stuff in life and in faith is none of our business. It is the why of life and faith that should concern us. And let me clue you in on the why of the Trinity. Our faith tells us that God created all things so that God might create us. That God created us so that might become one with us in Jesus Christ. And God becomes one with us in Jesus Christ so that we might, in turn, become one with our God in the kingdom forever. Those familiar with the Baltimore Catechism know that. Why did God make us? To know him, love him, serve him in this life, and be happy with him forever and eternal. That's the same answer then. It's the same answer now. That's the why of the Trinity in a nutshell. Our faith tells us we need to know and accept the good news Jesus teaches, the gospel. We need to know the needs of others, not what they may be doing or not doing, not what we think they should be doing. We need to be, know about what they need for care and concern. Those who need water, those who need food, those who need shelter, those who need clothing, justice, etc. We need to know that the care and concern of our neighbor is our gospel business. Our faith tells us we need to be the body of Christ. We need to make the kingdom of God present as much as possible here in this world. And how we live that concern and care of our neighbor is from the grace and the love of the Spirit, is through the actions of the brother Jesus, all to give honor and glory to the Father God. Theologically, Trinity is something in theology called circumcision. It's a type of unity, an innate unity of persons. What's that mean? The Father is God, but is not the Son or Spirit. The Son is God, but is not the Father or Spirit. And the Spirit is God, but not the Father and the Son. Wrap your mind around that. And yet, the three personages are one God. And how that occurs, well, again, as politely as possible, is none of our business. We're not supposed to understand the Trinity. It's a mystery, as we say, huh? As little as we know about the Trinity, still we know enough. We know that it is the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit, that is our foundation, that is our source, that is our protection, our assurance of a brighter tomorrow. We know that it is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, that empowers us to what? To endure the storms of life that come our way, the grave difficulty that leaves us powerless with a feeling of impotence as we watch a child unable to deal with the difficulties of life a loved one suffering physical or mental distress, as we see our marriage struggling and growing weaker day by day, as we witness our culture, our society, seeming to go from bad to worse, and evil continuing to raise its ugly head, as we struggle in our faith, 
trying to live what we say we believe and yet really can't understand. Theologically, the body of Christ is a unity of faithful believers, each and all living the gospel of life, of love, of service and forgiveness. That's the gospel. To be the body of Christ is our business. So what's going on in your family right now with you? How are you living up to the gospel commands? Well, ultimately, it's none of my business, is it? But while the works among us as children of God, that works among us, children of God, child to child, how we relate to God the Father and how we live the gospel of life is indeed God's business. Today on this feast, then, I would recommend and encourage and exhort you to live the gospel of life in all that you do, to share the gospel of love with all you meet, to commit the gospel of service to all others in true need, and to accept the gospel of forgiveness by learning to forgive so as to be forgiven for our failures in life. Today, to celebrate Trinity Sunday. The Trinity is our origin. The unity of the Trinity is our goal, our destination. Because of the Trinity, our purpose here on this earth is to form one family of faith from the many children of God. Today, then, accept the Trinity three in one as true mystery, yes, not totally understood as much as an encouragement, a possibility, an empowerment, and a sufficient answer to handle the problems entrusted to us. The Lord God, Father, Son, and Spirit, since the dawn of creation, has been constantly proving love for us, faithfulness to one another, care for us all. Today's feast, then, is but another attempt of this very loving God, the God who is love, to show us how much He loves us, finally becoming one with us in Jesus Christ. God so loved the world, we hear John saying, huh? If you feel impotent and powerless in dealing with the troubles of life, then listen as I say to the following to you. Turn to the Lord your God and be satisfied to know that we have a Father who created us and sustains us, a Son who died for us and saved us, a Spirit who continues even now to empower us to ever loving, ever creating, ever recreating each other into a child of God that we should become. Again, the howl of the Trinity is not as important as the why, and that alone should be sufficient for us. Today, then, and every day forward, may our thoughts, our actions, then echo the Trinitarian prayer that you've probably heard before. Blessed be God, the Father who creates us. Blessed be God, the Son who redeems us. Blessed be God, the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. Blessed be the holy and undivided Trinity, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit.